Hello everyone, Dr. Shane back with you. Uh, this one should be fairly short, so uh, well, we'll see. So this is basically reviewing some basic physics of light, properties like energy, wavelength, and frequency. And in the next lesson, we're gonna start to pull things together a little bit. So we talked a little bit about these two pictures already. And just to review, so you have the electromagnetic spectrum, and uh, over here, oh, by the way, the uh, study of light as it interacts with matter is called spectroscopy. It's a whole subdiscipline of science. So what we see here is, uh, and you'll have an instrument in lab that will do this. You'll be able to change the wavelength and then see how much light is absorbed by a particular molecule. And this is that marine algae. So there's actually a bunch of different molecules here. There's what, one, two, three, four, five, six different molecules that uh, this marine algae uses to harness solar energy. It's really, really good at it because it absorbs so much of the visible spectrum from what comes from the sun, which makes it really interesting and useful for something like that NASA Omega project. So we're going to talk more about that later. So to backpedal a little bit, you might recall that the visible region of the spectrum can be characterized by Roy G. Biv. And the way it's written, Roy G. Biv, is actually low energy to high energy, which in terms of wavelength is the exact opposite. High wavelength is low energy. Low, okay, so you get the idea. So in this spectrum that's shown with, with the... Uh, um, for the marine algae, it's actually Roy G. Biv in reverse. So red, orange, yellow, uh, Roy G. So green, Biv. So you get into blue. It's kind of hard to see the blue. Then indigo and violet. So that's kind of the traditional way, uh, or the, no, the non-traditional way of doing it. The traditional way you might know is, well, well, it, it, and it doesn't really matter. And if you go above violet, you get ultraviolet. If you go below red, you get infrared. So this is low energy and high energy. And what we want to do with this video is just to review these basic concepts and then some of the basic mathematics. Also, just to review, if you take the visible region and curl it into a wheel, it's not perfect. Uh, the color wheel, it, it helps us understand the difference between light that's transmitted, in other words, the color of something that you see, and the color that's absorbed. So for example, if something appears to be blue, like it's some metal complex or anything, that it could be blue food coloring. If it looks blue to you, then it absorbs orange. It absorbs the complementary color. Now this is not perfect, but it's a nice rule of thumb to distinguish between energy that's absorbed and energy that is transmitted that we then detect either with your bare eye or with an instrument like an ultraviolet or a visible spectrophotometer, which we'll do in lab. Okay, enough of that. That was just an overview and introduction. Let's get right to it. And just need to advance the slide. And I a couple of blank slides here to do some review. All right, so let's uh, start again with Roy G. Uh, Biv. That's fine. Low energy, high energy, and you might recall that light, the electromagnetic radiation, we can interpret as a wave, a sinusoidal wave. So a low energy wave might look like this. A high energy wave would be symbolized by this. And wavelength is the distance from one peak to the next peak. That's wavelength. Fine. So low energy means a long wavelength. High energy means a short wavelength. And that's called lambda. Fine. Okay, uh, the other characteristic that we often use that's complementary is what's called frequency which is how many times does the wave occur in a specific period of time? Well, for us, our specific period of time, because we want a standard, is one second. So how many times per second, well, sorry about that, per second does a wave go up and down? And that's called frequency. So frequency is how many cycles or how many waves per second. All right, that's sometimes called a hertz. 
How many times it go up and down per second? All right, so let's let's think about units here because we're going to put uh, some math into this as well into all these concepts. So frequency, since it's cycles per second, the unit of cycles is understood. The, the units are per second, so inverse seconds. Fine. Uh, wavelength. When we get to the math, we're actually going to use meters. And energy, we're going to stick with our standard unit of joules. So when we do the math, energy will be joules, wavelength will be meters, frequency will be inverse seconds. And then there's a couple of mathematical equations here that you're going to want to know. The, the, the classic one is that the energy of electromagnetic radiation is directly proportional to the frequency. So more frequency, more energy. And they are equated through a mathematical equation through a constant called Planck's constant. And uh, I'll give you this value. It's a pretty common one in science classes. You've probably heard of it before. If not, no problem. It has the constant value of 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th, really small, joules times seconds. The other form of the equation can be written if you want to relate energy and wavelength, because energy and wavelength are inversely proportional, is this relationship. If you take the frequency, or excuse me, the wavelength times its corresponding frequency, that gives you the speed of light. And the speed of light is, again, I would give you this, is a constant. If it wasn't, we'd be in trouble. 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. It's a speed. So if you relate this equation and this equation and make a substitution, you can also come up with the fact that energy and wavelength are inversely proportional by coming up with energy equals Planck's constant times the speed of light over the wavelength. Units are important. Joules here. Joules times seconds here. Meters per second here and meters here. So make sure you're paying attention to units. We don't have to do much uh, unit conversion. The visible region of the spectrum is nanometers. It's just a convenient unit. So that's times 10 to the minus ninth meters. Fine. Let's do um, a couple of problems. And then we're just going to call it a day. So have your calculator ready. I'm uh, not call it a day, call it a lesson. So switching over to the next one. All right. Uh, I'm not going to go back to that original graph, but the absorption spectrum that I gave you, let's see. So wavelength is here. And then how much light gets absorbed, I'll explain what that means later. And I'm just going to do something simple. So we're going to do this in the lab. You'll change the wavelength. You'll measure how much light is absorbed with a factor called absorbance. And you'll pick out the point where the wavelength, excuse me, the, wa the wavelength that gives you the maximum amount of absorbed light. That's often called the analytical wavelength. That's where you would conduct some kind of analysis. Or it's also what's called the wavelength of maximum absorption or symbolized lambda max. So in these two problems, we're going to compare two different things. So just to give you some practice with the math. So I'm going to give you two examples. And you can you can just do these on your own and and, uh, and, and just to make sure you understand what's going on. So um, let's do some things here. So let's let, we're going to compare chlorophyll A, and then the other one, I have to go through my notes here, phycoerythrin. You don't have to worry about that. I'm just going to give you the data. Phycoerythrin from the graph. Don't worry about really what those are. And if you go to the graphs, you can probably figure out, you might get a slightly different answer. For chlorophyll A, the lambda max is, uh, let's see, 415 nanometers. That's the wavelength that's absorbed. And go to the spectrum. That corresponds to violet light. So what color would chlorophyll A be? Well, I think it's supposed to be green, isn't it? So you can double check. Is the complementary color a violet green? It, 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 hopefully it is. I'm not too worried about that for this specific example. And for phycoerythrin, the lambda max, or one of them anyway, is uh, kind of mixing these two problems up, is 615 nanometers. Okay, well, that means that orange light is absorbed. So it probably looks blue or violet. Again, kind of start to get used to this. The wavelength that's absorbed 
the complementary wavelength is transmitted, and that's what it should look like. Again, it's not perfect, but what we want to do now is compare the energies of these two types of absorbed light. Now, you can already answer that question. Chlorophyll A absorbs a lower wavelength light, so that should be higher energy in comparison to 615 nanometers. Because if it's a longer wavelength, remember, it's lower energy. So I'm just comparing these two, not comparing everything in general. So this is going to be lower energy. Well, let's do the math and make sure that that works out. Remember, the equation is E. Since we have wavelength, it's going to be E equals HC over lambda. Let's just do the math. I'll do the first one for you and give you the answer for the second one. Energy is 6.626. Whoa times 10 to the minus 34th, let's pay attention to units, joules times seconds times the speed of light, 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, making sure you get the scientific notation in the proper position, numerator or denominator, and uh, four. 415 times 10 to the minus ninth meters, because that's nano, is better written as 4.15 times 10 to the minus seventh meters, proper scientific notation. Do all that math, three sig figs, and you should get, I'm kind of bleeding into this one here, sorry, I'll write the answer up here for the other one. You should get 4.79 times 10 to the minus 19th joules. I'm not going to do it here, but if you wanted to convert this into, that's that's for one photon, which is kind of odd. If you want to convert this into a kilo, or excuse me, joules per mole, you would simply multiply by Avogadro's number, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Then you could even convert it to kilojoules per mole uh, by, what would that be, by dividing by 1,000. So that's, that's fine. That would make it a more of a unit that you're familiar with. Kilojoules per mole is something we used before. So if we did all of this correctly, you get 4.79 times 10 to the minus 19th joules. If you replace the 4.15 times 10 to the minus 7th meters with 6.15 times 10 to the minus nanometers here, well, you should get something that's lower in energy. It just kind of makes sense. And I'll let you do that one. The answer you should get for phycoerythrin is energy equals 3.23 times 10 to the minus 19th joules. Okay, that's just an overview of how you do the math. I'm not going to do every single kind of problem, but if you're given an energy, you should be able to calculate a wavelength and a frequency. If you're given a frequency, you should be able to calculate a wavelength and an energy. Okay, all those combinations, you should be able to do all of those, and then relate it back to the visible spectrum, and then relate it back to what kind of light you should see compared to what kind of light is absorbed. Excellent. Uh, that is quite good, and that's where we're going to leave off, and we kept that under 15 minutes, which is kind of nice.